This is Democracy in Lockdown, a weekly virtual conversation on the latest news about the coronavirus crisis and what it means for our democracy. This podcast is presented by Unlock Democracy. We campaign for a better democracy and a new written constitution built and owned by the people. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Democracy in Lockdown. My name is Matthew and I am the Membership and Fundraising Assistant at Unlock Democracy. And with me today is Trudy. Hi, I'm Trudy. I'm Campaigns and Operations Officer for Unlock Democracy. How are you doing, Trudy? Yeah, I'm okay. It's starting to get a lot warmer and my poor Irish skin can't handle it very well. Uh, <laughs> but I'm um, getting used to it and it's not exactly the worst thing in the world. What about you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, finding it hard to sleep in, in this heat, it's weird. Um, but getting along, and I suppose if, if, that's the, if that's the biggest problem you could think of, then all's not too bad, really, from a personal standpoint. For sure. So last week, we talked about the impact of the pandemic on migrant workers and how the government's structural and systematic decisions have real impacts on migrant communities and workers especially. We heard from Dolores Modern, who is Policy and Communications Coordinator at the Latin American Women's Rights Service in London, and she specialises in employment rights. If you haven't listened to it already, do go back and find that episode. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, really amazing. I cannot recommend that enough. Um, this week, we'll be talking about how students and young people have been impacted by the pandemic and what the upcoming recession might mean for their future. So stay with us. So over the past week, um, we've seen quite a few developments. There's a a lot to get through, really. Lots of school-aged children are back at school amid concerns from parents and teaching unions that this is way too soon. MPs are today debating whether the House of Commons should be able to vote remotely. The UK government wants to restrict remote voting for MPs, which would in some cases stop them from representing their constituencies in some important debates. And over the past week, demonstrations have erupted across the US and further across the world as well, um, including in in the UK, in protest that systematic and institutional racism in United States institutions. We've seen really, really dangerous actions in response by US authorities, not only attacking protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets and applying really, really tough curfews, but even threatening to deploy armed forces if state governors refuse to activate their own National Guard militias. And in addition to that, right-wing groups have taken this as cover to mobilise and be violently racist. Here at Unlock Democracy, we feel that there is no place for racism in a truly inclusive and democratic society. And we express full solidarity with those protesting and those organising at this time. So with that said, let's kick off. Okay, so this week we're going to be looking at issues faced by young people during the pandemic, um, but also in general. And we're going to be taking a sort of longer view at how young people have related to democracy and to government over the past few years. So successive governments in the UK have formed over the past decade with absolutely enormous support from primarily, but not exclusively, older voters. And this tends to get reflected in the priorities that they have. Until 2018, for example, it was really, really hard for under 21s to claim housing benefit in their own regard. And that meant that lots of young people were unable to leave homes in which they sometimes weren't welcome. Youth unemployment is currently at about 11.5%. And that's probably underestimating the number of people who want more work or are underemployed. Apprenticeship starting rates have flatlined and are currently falling. And home ownership, importantly, is beyond most, with social housing even more scarce. This kind of mindset tends to get reflected in the news and media agenda, in which lots of young people are troped as either lazy or entitled, not being like self-starters enough, um, often described as the sort of me generation. And there's a feeling, I think, among many of us, certainly for me in particular, that there's this real divide in our democracy, in who government power is accountable to, for its legitimacy and for its success at the ballot box and beyond. And it's clear enough to me anyway that young people are on the wrong side of that divide. So we're going to be getting into this a little bit more. 
we're now in yet another recession, the recession of 2020 after the Great Recession of 2008-9 and the second dip in 2012. And as we've already described, we know that young people come out of economic downturns worse off on average. Of course, I was 12 in 2008 and I don't have clear memories um, from what went down around then. I certainly didn't experience it um, myself. But Trudy, as I remember, you were either leaving school or about to leave school. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear, you know, your personal experience of, of that time and, and how that relates to some of the things that we've that we've just been over. Yeah, so I left secondary school, for example, just as the financial crash hit. I moved to England to go to university not long after. I don't really remember a huge amount related to cr- to the crash as I was, you know, eager to get out of my hometown and go to uni. I didn't think about it that much because I was quite young, um, just a school leaver. But I do know lots of people who lost their homes and lost their jobs, had to remortgage their house. And I've encountered since many Irish and Northern Irish people who were forced to emigrate because of it. At that point, I'd never really consider the generational gap between me and my parents who were for example very easily able to secure a mortgage for their twelve thousand pound terrace house in the 1980s and over time i realized that obtaining a mortgage today would be next to impossible without a hefty amount of savings and these savings are savings that are prevented by stagnating wages and the high cost of living in london to name but a few examples um So I was the first person in my family to go to university at that time. And I thought that this was a sure way to a career that it kind of ensured a better a better standard of living that I I would be able to attain in the future. But when I graduated university, I found there were really no jobs to go to except in the hospitality and retail sectors. So the subsequent austerity that came from the financial crash had brought deep spending cuts to local governments. Whenever I graduated in 2012, this was very apparent. I remember at one point having trying to access a housing benefit and it taking around three months before we were able to get any help to pay our rent. Um, and those of my friends who didn't go into higher education generally either took entry level jobs in an unrelated field or worked in retail and hospitality just like myself. It's worth to note that 30 million workers became unemployed employed between 2007 and 2010, which overcrowded the job market and left many graduates underemployed and taking positions that would be suited for those who may not have had the same chance to study as they had. When I went to university in 2009, uh, school leavers had to decide whether or not they were going to be able to pay the £3,000 fees. And later, for example, for people like Matthew, uh, £9,000 extortionate Piece. So over a decade now has passed since the global financial crisis, but once again we see ourselves facing a steep economic recession in 2020. For example, the IMF states that in the first quarter of 2020, the economy contracted by 2% relative to the previous quarter, with a 5.8% month-on-month contraction in March. And we are left asking questions if two generations will have to face a just as difficult, if not worse, job market. In trying to find something a bit more positive in this, what it did make me was a lot more political active and more aware of uh, the systemic failures of the system. For example, fees demos in 2010 were a big reason why some of my friends and I continue to engage in community organizing and activism. And these people are now out in the workforce challenging the status quo. With many students already engaging in climate justice activism and familiar with taking action, it could also be a catalyzing moment in mobilizing for justice. If you like this podcast, Click the subscribe button and follow us on social media. So we asked around for uh, some people to send us a statement, uh, current students in the UK. So from this student, they say, as a member of Youth Parliament, the coronavirus crisis has suspended a lot of youth voice work. I meant activists have had to adapt to the new situation through 
digital striking and heavily relying on social media to discuss social issues. I think I speak on behalf of many young campaigners when I say we feel stunted and trapped as if we can't make a difference due to being in lockdown. It's scary to think that as huge as the pandemic is, that it is detracting attention from serious issues that need to be acted upon now, such as climate change and Black Lives Matter. Hopefully these campaigns can gain momentum following the lockdown and utilising this time to organise and strengthen their causes. There's a lot of talk about how the pandemic will act as a catalyst and contribute to a shift in attitude and action regarding the environment, especially since emission levels have considerably declined. However, I think that perspective is too rose-tinted as we must recognise that humans have a pretty tarnished track record when it comes to learning from history and past mistakes. Furthermore, we must recognise it as once more minority groups facing the brunt of the consequences of lockdown and the pandemic. Asian communities being targeted with racist comments and attacks. Black workers such as Beli Manjinga being spat at by someone who claimed to have COVID-19 and who later died, arguably as a result of that assault. It's Eaton and countless other private schools that can afford to provide higher standard online resources and choose to postpone reopening their schools, while state schools with already overpopulated classes and less money are forced into opening, despite health concerns from experts and unions. As a student aiming to attend Cambridge University, I feel helpless and as I'm navigating through an already stressful and difficult time alone, that feeling is amplified. Despite my sixth form being extremely helpful and supportive, a lot of events such as open days and courses have been cancelled. I can't help but feel confused and scared, especially for my mental health and grades, which will suffer as a result of a potential mental health crisis. Many young people feel on age and in a perverse way, as if their teenage years are being stolen from them. So I don't know about you, Trudy, but I found that really, really interesting, um, partly because I'm not exactly in the same position um, as, you know, young people like the student whose statement you just read out, um, but also because I think it's really impressive how how people so young um, are able to articulate such a strong um, sort of analysis of their own situation, you know, very clear about where they are. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sort of drilling down into like where this generational divide comes from and where we could go from here. So the question we're asking is why it is that this generational divide in, in experiences that we've, that we've seen, but also in, in wealth, in income, in employment, in housing, in housing standards, where the, these divides have opened up and where they came from. And I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts, Trudy. I think from my my perspective, I really see this as a as a consequence of long term government policy, which has created a new way in which people expect to live and in which people expect to ensure their economic security. Since the early 1980s, various successive governments have introduced policies uh, that they've described as asset based welfare provision or incentives to work. Um, incentives to buy houses, whether those are right to buy or later help to buy under the coalition government. But these policies have all created a system of social insurance, which is very much based on accumulating savings and buying houses. And lots of houses were sold off in the 1980s and, and 90s at relatively generous rates. Um, to people who would be expected to buy those houses, um, own those houses, and use those houses as, as collateral in further borrowing, um, but also use those houses to ensure their livelihoods and their economic security later in life. And so we've seen that these things um, aren't now available for younger generations for whom um, the only option is often to rent at really high levels, often from people who were able to buy houses for relatively little uh, just 20 or 30 years earlier. And so we've come to a situation where older generations, um, through government policy, it must be said, um, are now much more reliant on the value of their houses. And so various governments have shown that they're interested in preserving the value of those houses and even inflating the value. And so I really see, I suppose, the generational divide that's opened up um, as something that governments in the past 40 years have, have created and, and sustained, 
and something that they continue to sustain by um, chasing the votes of people who either currently own homes or might be able to to secure mortgages and for the rest of for the rest of the country and um, for a predominantly younger segment of the population um, that just isn't possible and so yeah i really see this as a as a question of whether young people have a stake in in the economic system that the governments have have created um but i'd be interested to hear your thoughts yeah i think going off what you said about right to buy i think it's also worth noting that although right to buy was introduced and could have been something that was positive for people there was no extra provision for socially rented housing made so it was an increase where there there is now a huge gap in being able to access services and access houses um, young people are, tend to be young single people tend to be at the bottom of the list for that it's hard to say but the generational divide is and where we get with who's in power is down it's down to demographics almost i feel like the population of young people is not as large as the population of older people who have these kind of assets and there's a political case to be made for the right to vote at 16 for example which some organizations campaign for i think yeah to go back on what i said earlier as well the financial crash affected a whole generation of people differently than the generation who came before them of course there are people who suffered who are in in the older generation generation who lost their homes and for sure the the pension pot has also been affected the oldest in our society and the youngest in our society are also uh, are, are affected the most by this definitely and um i suppose one thing you know having having set out that you know my my personal sort of explanation i guess of the generational divide which you know which people might disagree with and which is quite simplistic you know it's not the whole story we don't have time for the whole story on these relatively short podcasts um, because if we did, you know, we'd be here all day. But I think one thing that's worth mentioning is, as, as Trudy says rightly, that, you know, lots and lots of older people, you know, have seen their pensions reduce in value. And often what that actually does is make make people more reliant on the value of things like houses. It makes you you more reliant on, on things, that, on the value that you can preserve in, you know, among your assets. And so I think it's important to point out that while, you know, we're talking about a younger generation which has been shut out of um, a system of, you know, um, like house price inflation and, and sort of savings accumulation um, that an older generation has experienced, the older generation isn't always experienced this, experiencing this as luxury. You know, it's, it, it doesn't mean that older people don't, you know, face serious struggles, including financial struggles. Um, but it does mean, I suppose, that we need to be ready to articulate a politics which can sort of break that divide down and really persuade people from each demographic group, I suppose, that there is a future which can provide for, for, for all groups. And perhaps that future you know, involves young people being more democratically active in, in the way that Trudy describes. Um, just one thing I've noticed over the past few days, in fact, I think it might have been yesterday, um, but 16-year-olds um, recently got the vote um, in Welsh local elections and in Welsh assembly elections, which will be taking place next year, um, as they have had the vote in Scottish national elections as well. Um, so we're already seeing a bit of that shift in, in some regions, and hopefully that's something we can, we can see more of. Yeah, for sure. I think that young people today as well are way quicker to mobilise uh, way quicker to organise as well and hopefully some public pressure from young people on the government can finally have some good rewards for our society as a whole. We have seen some democratic participation with the Climate Assembly, uh, although very limited in its remit and actually uh, demographically as well because it isn't included in some younger people in our society, is certainly a step forward and showing that the government is taking public opinion into account ever so slightly. <laughs> I suppose the, the question left is sort of what to make of that because we covered an awful lot of ground um, and I've sort of I, th I suppose I've said I've said it already the main thing I want to take away and that's that the way to fight this is 
not to focus on, you know, starting some sort of fight between generations, you know, based on, you know, who's got more, who's got less. And because ultimately we're fighting over an ever smaller like slice of pie. And the important thing to do is to articulate a democratic politics that can break that divide down and really you know, build a system that rewards people of all ages. And so that's ensuring the financial um, you know, health security of older generations, but making sure that that doesn't come at a cost to their children and grandchildren. Um, and to young people across the board. Be interested to hear your conclusions, Trudy. I think you're absolutely right there, Matthew, in that, and I would go a bit further to say that young people should be the ones starting the conversation, initiating those uh, discussions, some of them difficult discussions as well, uh, building confidence in themselves and educating other people, uh, breaking down uh, assumptions about millennials and Gen Z. I think the only way to do that is to work together, which, well, I mean, for me, it sounds like a bit, little bit of a cop-out sentence, but, uh, for, <laughs> but for sure. If you've enjoyed hearing us nattering on today and you want to hear more like this, then do sign up to our mailing list if you haven't already. You'll hear from me, Trudy, and the rest of the team on a regular basis, and we'll keep you updated by email on all the latest campaign news. We'll be putting a link in the description and you can also find the sign up form on our website. Thanks very much for today, Matt. It was definitely a very interesting session. It was great. Thanks very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be coming back next Thursday with more. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share.